from the start Spirits inside your bones move through your heart You've got no say from the start Spirits inside your bones move through your heart Yeah, you're an Indian man A crazy horse You're an Indian man Your chief dad I was looking at the first edition of the Native Voice. Well, a little bit sad because all the people in the picture with me are gone now and I'm the only one left. And it just brings back good memories of uh, involvement with the Native Brotherhood. The Native Brotherhood first begun in the 1930s. At that time, it was illegal for Aboriginal people to meet. So the people who created the Native Brotherhood had to try to find a way to get around that law and uh, find a way to fight the, fight the issues. And they did that by going under the umbrella of the church. And the anthem for the Brotherhood at that time was Onward Christian Soldiers. My name is Edwin Newman, and I'm from Bella Bella. I was a prisoner of Native Brotherhood for 11 years. I remember the first uh, convention I went to in Bella Bella. Many people from the interior couldn't speak English. So a lot of the business was done in Chinook, the trade language. Henry and I are doing a little uh, Chinook this morning. I got two scoop of wawa. I think it tum tum. I'm Henry Clifton from Hartley Bay, fisherman. One of the founders, I guess, was my great-grandfather, Heber Clifton. And two of my uncles were presidents, both named Robert Clifton. My uncle Edward Nahaney was a business agent for the Native Brotherhood for around 27 years. So now I help Nathan Latash Kushawmain to know that Sean the name that I carry is Latash Maurice Nahini. I'm from the village of Oslohan. I live in North Vancouver from the Squamish Nation. The Native Brotherhood was a very powerful organization on the coast because it brought the bands together to work together. 
There was that sense of belonging that we were all in the same cause, we were all in the same page working together. Listening to the leaders speak with such passion about their rights, because they were fighting really for their families. For some reason in the province of BC, the court system refused to, re to recognize Aboriginal rights and titles. They wanted to sweep it aside and ignore it. But the Brotherhood was really strong in putting those rights forward and being strong voices for us. It battled for many things for the Aboriginal people. Better education and better health services, better housing. Very difficult at that time for our native people to get a good education. The residence school could only go as far as grade eight. They started with the hunting, the fishing, and trying to get a union to help the fishermen. The brother the created programs like Indian Fishermen's Assistance Program, and uh, used that to help uh, Aboriginal people buy boats and licenses so they could become entrepreneurs in the fishery. At that time, just the only organization to just uh, try and do those things for Indian people. We lost a lot of our land. We, our rights were pushed aside. But it's the leadership of the Brotherhood that really, really had to fight for us. And they put their lives on the line. They put their reputations on the line. They yeah, got the government to take the restrictions off the potlots. We were able to practice our customs again. When it came time, to conventions or if there was a cause that uh, the old guys had to go and do. The bosses, the women, started up basket socials, the coffee, cake, sandwich sales and, and had meetings about what was going on, what they had to raise money for. So this happened in all the locals, the Native Brotherhood locals. We were the ones that raised the funds to keep the Native Brotherhood going because they didn't have any government funds. We didn't want government funds because we wanted to fight our own battle without any restrictions uh, put on us. And that's the way it was with our, with our people. You know, we didn't wait for somebody to do something, so we made things happen. That's right, what I remember with the Native Brotherhood. My name is Wayne LaValle. My name is Richard Brown. My name is Russell Wallace. I come from the Lilawat Nation. I grew up in America from African American and uh, Cherokee descendants. I am from the Metis Nation from St. Laurent, Manitoba. My name is JJ LaValle. My name is Ronnie Dean Harris. My ancestral names are Kola. Maloholek, and my people come from Yale, Coquitlam, the Lilwat, Statlium Nations, and also the Stala region. I am originally from St. Ambrose, Manitoba, a small Métis community of about 300 people. My name is Murray Porter. My name is Corey Payette. I'm Oji Cree First Nations from the Matagami Nation in Northern Ontario. A Mohawk. Turtle Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I am a singer-songwriter, composer, guitar player. I'm a drummer. I am a hip-hop artist, a singer, a composer. I'm a Métis fiddler. I am a traditional singer and a composer. And what I do, sing the blues. I write songs, I play the piano, and I sing about the struggle of our people.
Siganam nak to be worship, Dalgam Hat mean, worship with House of Lark. No, I'm a bit more like scared like a numpish with a mammal look like. My English name is Vera Newman. I come from the Numris and the Mammal Laka tribe and the Kwakwala people from Alert Bay. I always knew about the Brotherhood because my dad was a fisherman, my grandparents and my uncles, they all fished from Alert Bay area. And we always heard about this fight of the Brotherhood. And it was quite natural to be part of it. It's something that we were very proud of, to be part of the Native Sisterhood. The Native Sisterhood was started way before my time. My grandmother was part of it back in the 40s. I got involved in 1973 when a man called George Jeffrey came to Alert Bay and we all got elected to be part of the Native Brotherhood branch of Alert Bay and I was elected to be the president of the Native Sisterhood at the time. And then we got involved. We started to go to Brotherhood conventions and did fundraising to support our, our fishermen. My name is Karen Jeffrey. I'm from the Ganhada tribe. I'm Simshan from the North Coast. My grandfather was one of the original founding members before the Native Brotherhood was established. Him and my grandmother would travel together to the various villages to form the Native Brotherhood. My grandmother was alongside him. You know, the women were the backbone of the Native Brotherhood to help them establish and fight for the Native rights. When I started working for the Native Brotherhood, my job was to recruit membership 
to liaison with all the various communities up and down the coast. I was 19, 19 years old. At the time, back in the mid-70s, vessels were more family-oriented. So basically what I would do is go to the docks during fishing season and talk with the fishermen and the women, the families, and get them to sign up with the Native Brotherhood. And people were willing to support the cause because we were a long way from our struggles to be gone. Our women were dedicated to support our men. The ladies in the Bay, way before my time, got together to do all kinds of fundraising events to help out the struggle. So when we came along, we did our own way of fundraising through different events, raffles and bingo and dances. It wasn't like a, a woman's movement, do you know what I mean? We didn't play that role. No. We, it was to make sure that the families, that we had adequate rights. We learned things by visiting different communities, what worked there and what we, what we could do to make things better in our village for our people. My name is Delia Nahaney. I'm from the Nishgat Nation. We grew up in the canneries. Uh, running back and forth on the on the wharves while our parents were out fishing or they were working in the canneries. I remember when I was 15 and my dad bought me my first pair of rubber boots and um, he, you know and then then he just pointed me towards the office and said sign up you're gonna go to work and then my auntie Norma Morgan pulled out a fish and she showed me what to do. <laughs> She said the most important thing is to sign up for the Native Union. We had really good wages and overtime hours. And unfortunately, I had a bit of a mishap and I ended up in the hospital. And the union paid, paid uh, for the days that I was in the hospital. Aboriginal people worked together. Everyone had a little part. It's the common bowl theory. You know, and that's just part of being a union as Aboriginal people. I guess the real special thing for us is the lifetime friendships we made along the coast, that we learned to respect each other and learn to work together for the betterment of all of us. The Native Brotherhood stood for unity, and unity throughout the coast, and we all stood together proudly. You would see our flags, the Native Brotherhood flags, flying high and proud on the boats throughout the BC coast. Tanoyap, Tanoan Siam and Siaya, Mechemko Shaman, Mercy Nahini, Kriansna, Skolholtmesh Ochmelch, Tanishka Ochmelch, Aun and Oxen Squalo and Teat Seats. My ancestral name is Mech Cheem, my English name is Mercy Nahini, I come from the Squamish and Niskat peoples, and I am proud of who I am. Sigoli Iskanagoa, my name is Sherry Miracle, I'm from Six Nations, Ontario, I'm Mohawk and Irish, and I am an actor, and I'm a singer, and I'm a songwriter. My name is Shakti Hayes. I am from the Cree Nation, George Gordon Band in Saskatchewan. My name is Michelle St. John. I'm a musician, a vocalist, a artist. I am uh, an actor, singer, writer. I'm Wampanoag, African-American, Jewish. I grew up in Toronto. My name is Jennifer Kreisberg. I'm Tuscarora from North Carolina. I'm a mother, singer, composer, activist. I've always been encouraged to publicly speak, to share culture, to be a teacher. My ancestral name is Shamansot. I come from the village of Asla'an and Gitwansel. I come from the Squamish and Niskat Nation. I'm Tom Berger from Vancouver. Uh, I'm a lawyer. In the early 1960s, I worked with uh, an older lawyer named Tom Hurley. 
The law office that Tom occupied was also used by Maisie, his wife, to get out the native voice. My name is Moira Movana, granddaughter of Maisie Hurley. My grandmother started the native voice in 1946, and she worked with the members of the Native Brotherhood. The Toronto Star said it was the most unusual paper in North America, what they did and how they did it. The Native Voice was the voice of the uh, Native Brotherhood and the Native people on the coast. Mrs. Hurley actually produced the Native Voice uh, in her office. I still remember her office with these stacks of the Native Voice and, and the place was crowded. She had artifacts, portraits, uh, and she stomped around with her cane uh, giving orders. What made her so passionate? Well, her lineage her life experiences, and who she was. She was a rebel. She broke wild horses when she was a, a teenager. She was entirely devoted to the cause. A remarkable woman. When you talk about the native voice and how much it meant to the people in the villages, that there was no other way of contact. In the old days, there wasn't a kind of a communication system that you have in place today, like phones. And uh, the only way we could uh, know what other people were doing was with the news newspaper. It was really important to know what, what our struggles were and all up and down the coast. And that was one vessel that we used to get the information across. I know in Bella Bella we all looked forward to the next edition of the Native Voice to find out what's going on. I always felt good when something good was happening for some of our people, even if they didn't come from our community. It was quite a thrill when we saw our pictures in it. I come from this tiny little village. I think the only thing we had was like radio. Um, mm. and, uh, and it was so exciting to get the native voice. I was just in grade school, but I knew it was something special. You know, my parents read it and it was always around the house and it wasn't used for anything else. It was just used for reading and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <We're> just... <laughs> when I first read it, I thought it was hilarious because they wrote of everything. Weddings, birthdays, what uh, fun functions are coming. And it, was, it was so worldly before, our, before its time. Maisie Hurley did us a big favor when she helped us to have them get the native voice of British Columbia. You know, it was a paper of the Native Brotherhood, you know? So thank you for that granddaughter of Maisie. When I had gone to law school in the 1950s, nobody taught anything about Aboriginal rights, Aboriginal title. Nobody told us in law school in those days that the native people of uh, British Columbia had any rights. I know it sounds, it sounds very odd today, but that was the case. Tom Hurley died suddenly. He was in his late 70s. And Maisie uh, said to me that I would have to represent the native causes that she had used to arrange for Tom to represent. She could be imperious, I guess is the word, but that's uh, uh, how she got me involved. She just said, uh, this is what you're going to do now. Within a month, she had come in uh, with a case of two young men uh, Clifford White and David Bob of the Nanaimo band who had been charged with hunting out of season. And uh, Guy Williams, who was the president of the Native Brotherhood in those days, spoke to me about the case and uh, he said that they had treaties that protected their hunting rights. So we went to court. I remember it all very well because uh, 
This was really the first case that I had done, or that anybody had done. And uh, I remember at the trial in Nanaimo, in an old courtroom there, uh, Maisie Hurley, of course, with her cane, uh, was uh, standing right uh, behind me. And Native people from Nanaimo and elsewhere occupied all the seats. We argued that there was a treaty. The, the government said, no, there's no treaty. It's just a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything. And we said, well, uh, then if there's no treaty, we uh, stand on our Aboriginal rights of hunting and fishing. In the end, that case went to the Supreme Court of Canada. We were successful in upholding the treaty and it was backed by the Native Brotherhood throughout, which was uh, important to enable it to proceed through each stage of appeal. And it was really the first shot in the legal battle to establish Aboriginal rights and Aboriginal title uh, for um, First Nations in BC. After we had won that case, the uh, four chiefs of the Nishka Nation in Nass Valley came to see me, and that led to the Calder case. The Nishka Tribal Council went to the Supreme Court of Canada and established that Aboriginal title was a uh, a living, breathing part of Canadian law. Today, uh, Section 35 explicitly acknowledges the Aboriginal rights and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. When I started out in this area, there was no Section 35. There was no acknowledgement of Aboriginal rights or Aboriginal title. The legal profession was essentially ignorant of the the true history uh, of, of their own province. In the days when the Brotherhood was powerful, we had one common enemy, that was the government of Canada. We pulled out of the treaty forces because they were trying to extinguish our title and rights. Because we, without our title and rights, we got nothing. And the history of people were never allow anybody to extinguish their title and rights to the ocean and to the land. That's what the Brotherhood stood for to begin with. They wanted to do away with our system, with who we were as our First Nations people. Take away our language and take away our culture. Canada is one of the worst human rights records in, in the world. And yet they go around preaching to other people about how they treat their people. You know? Why not they clean up their own house before they go out and do that? There's a big issue here they need to deal with. And that's the First Nations people. You know, and I hear people talk about forgiveness. I, I find it very hard to forgive the government of Canada and, and the Christian church for what they did to, to, to us.
I could have chosen a different profession, but I chose to be a performer, and I chose to um, use who I am to say something. I'm a musician, a blues singer, songwriter, all that, but first and foremost, I'm First Nations, I'm Mohawk. So I write about things in a way that entertains but also educates. If I observe something in the world that hurts my spirit or hurts my feelings, and I really feel like that is not cool and that's got to change, um, at the age I'm at now or where I'm at in my life now, it's like, okay, I want to do this in a good way, in a way that, that encourages people to come together to make things better. So how can I do that well? For me, that's with harmonies. I feel that, uh, that music is, is kind of an ethereal voice um, in, in both cultures, in all cultures. And uh, so the, the, the sound of the drum is, um, is godlike, if you will. I never approach a show or I never approach a, a speech with a script, because I was told that you can speak to people's ears, it goes in and out. You speak to people's hearts, and it stays there forever. The longhouse voice that we use, it's a loud voice that speaks to your spirit, so that your spirit reverberates with every word. The tones and the language and the sounds that we use, the vibrations that interconnect with your spirit are important energies. So this storytelling that we use, the stories and the tone from our ancestors, the frustrations of our matriarchs might seem like a tax on non-Indigenous people, but it's how we convey the urgency. It's how we convey the power that we need to grow forward. And so the sounds might be harsh and it might sound like we're yelling at you, but this is how we speak to your spirit and your heart and hope that we can meet on common grounds of values so we can move forward as a collaborative global community and hoping that indigenous people will have our say in that global conversation, even if it sounds mean sometimes.
fat by fat Everything is fine Everything is fine You got lies as deep as your pockets You got more than you need Well you got, well you get While we keep the bleeding Keep the bleeding family's history on both sides has informed who I am as an artist today. We come from four generations of seven girls who all sang. My mom had six sisters and they all used to sing and then our, our grandma, their mother, had six sisters. There were seven girls and they used to sing and it goes back two more generations. I just grew up in a family with music that's uh, one of the last things that was left of our culture and uh, happily our family held on to that. I am always asking myself questions around where do I belong and how do I fit in this place? In that mixed blood identity, there's something kind of liberating about not being afraid of all of those ancestors, all of those folks who've had many, many different experiences and uh, somehow they thread their way and work their way down into me. It's important to understand the complex, multi-dimensional history that is not necessarily written, that's not necessarily documented in a way that is um, you know, easy to access, that you have to find other ways into that history into the stories, into the, the people. There's a song that um, came to me, the melody came to me um, as I sat on my great grandmother's grave. So I call it the grandmother's song because I figure she gave it to me. Grandmother 
sing your songs to me. Sing your songs of love and freedom. Teach us who we are to be. We I know my grandmother raised 12 children on her own in a white town. And they dealt with a lot of racism. My father dealt with a lot of racism. He fought his whole life. Because he fought, I am who I am. Ancestors pray for my children. Pray your songs of truth and freedom we are here to honor you i didn't really know my native culture my parents never talked about it my mom was a cree speaker um, but she never spoke around us because of her upbringing and um, I kind of had to seek it elsewhere, but um, it was an important part of my history that I felt a right to reclaim, and so I went about that as an adult and kind of sought it out through just meeting people, musicians and artists that were in touch with that side of my culture and just wanting to learn more about who I was as a Native woman from the prairies. I didn't meet my mom until I was about 16. So there was always that kind of wondering who I am, you know, what kind of shaped me and, um, you know, where did I get this passion for music? I knew I was native, but I didn't know what that meant to me. When I was about 20 years old, I started learning about my family history and why me and my brothers and sisters got put in foster homes and then rediscovering that my family had a big musical history and learning that my grandfather used to play fiddle at parties, like standing on his, on his head and stuff like that. And now, you know, through my musical journey and learning about who I am as a, a native man and still trying to figure what that is, because I, I still keep meeting my family all the time. I didn't grow up on reserve and I didn't grow up with a family that celebrated their culture. So when I got old enough to start asking those questions, there was a lot of feeling from my family that why are you asking these questions? We don't, don't tell people you're First Nations. Don't talk about who you are, just say you're French Canadian. And then in finding out more about my culture and the history, I then realized that that was my role as an artist, was to hold up what I hadn't been taught and to spark that dialogue in the community. Here you are. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just take this out of the bag for you. We've got your accessories here. There you go. I've been around music since the day I was born. 21 aunts and uncles, somebody plays fiddle, somebody sings. And I was highly influential. I remember being a kid and I remember falling asleep on my uncle's guitar. There would be fresh bread baked in the kitchen. This was at night. We had a local station called the Polka Party, and they would play fiddle music, and uh, my grandmother would grab me, and we would dance. And she had sort of like muckluck type uh, slippers, leather, and they would hit the floor, tss, 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 and it's like that engraved the beat into my soul somehow. If you can make that crash symbol sit like right here, that'd be fantastic. From the beginning of my interest in playing music, I always wanted to, to be meaningful. The nature of social politics has definitely uh, impacted my life on, on, on every level, and especially as an artist.
My great grandfather was a tuba player in the Pentecostal church. My grandfather played the drums and my grandmother played the piano. They left the world too early for them to teach me anything, but somehow that blood runs through my veins and the things that they stood for come through me as well. Both sides of my family went through residential school. Therefore, I didn't have my language or my culture. I had to learn these things afterwards. So they influenced me to be a good, strong, respectful man. And that's what I try to be. Respect your elders, respect the children, respect women, and respect yourself in that order. A long history is at the heart of the music that I do. My mom was a traditional singer, and uh, she learned a lot of music and songs from her family, from her aunties and such. She told me to carry that on, and so I do carry that on. I'm really thankful that I had a mother who kept the music alive in spite of having to be forcefully removed from her community and having the language beaten out of her. The Salish languages are very consonant heavy, so like if I write something in the language, it's hard to sing. Um, and that's why we have vocables. Uh, vocables are primarily made up of uh, uh, vowel sounds, and so that's what carries a lot of the uh, melody forward. Vocables convey an emotion or something you're trying to say without a specific language. When languages were outlawed everywhere, uh, because for some reason they were a threat to, uh, to assimilation, um, after the language was outlawed, I guess the vocables came in as ways to sort of keep culture alive, keep songs, keep writing new songs. But if they didn't have language, I guess you wouldn't get in as much trouble. If you want to write songs that can go into different communities, Everybody can sing them and share those songs because they're not um, specific lingually. So there's just sort of a way of uniting the people these days through song. Our family has always had a past history of creating effective changes, all the way from my first protest when I was in grade four and we were supposed to learn French. And go, un, deux, trois, quatre. And it just didn't make sense to me. I was sitting there and this, is, this isn't my language. Why am I learning this language? And every single hair in my body just said this was wrong. And I asked if I could learn my language. And it's called Holtmish. And they said no, because there's no one there to teach it. And so I refused to learn French. And they said, well, you could sit at the office. So I went to the office for two weeks every single day. And sure enough, after that, we ended up having a language program. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity. In high school, I was labeled an at-risk youth. When I was growing up, I was always told to be proud of who I am and where I come from. I knew I was Squamish, I knew I was Niskat. I grew up with the songs and dances and had this immense pride of who I am. And in high school, I, the curriculum and the teachers didn't really know how to acknowledge our truth and who we are and where we come from. So I felt very resistant to that. I started learning more about the residential schools, about the Indian Act, um, different Canadian policies that have segregated us. And that made me really mad. I tried to utilize my culture and my English writings and submitting essays. And my teachers would say, well, where did you get that information from? Um, what book did you get that from? What reference do you have? And I say, well, my grandparents, my grandmother told me that. I'm like, well, that's not, you know, something factual that you can hand in, so you get a D. And so that kept happening in different courses and different projects that I would submit, and I just dropped out. Uh, I, was being, I was really tired of being called uh, at-risk youth. Um, today, what I call at-risk youth are culturally deprived youth. 
because growing up and learning more about society, about the economy, about the government, and different policies that impact our people, I'm finding that it's, it was deliberate what they were doing, um, deliberately teaching us not to be Squamish and not to be Niska. My seven times great-grandfather was Chief Emmett LaQuilton, and he was our last Grand Chief here in the Stalo region in the Fraser Canyon, and was instrumental in a resistance against gold miners and militias who came up to destroy and pillage our lands for gold in the 1850s Canyon Gold War. And so it is inherent for me as a young man stepping into my manhood, that activism and doing my part is a part of who I am. And I could feel the ancestors with me as I research and as I navigate this new contemporary world that we live in. A Canadian constitution with Indian law. An Indian territory into confederation. An Indian boundary territory authority. And an Indian provisional government that will be elected and controlled by the Indian nations. That's powerful. Like he thought so far out of the box. He just didn't compromise. He didn't ever compromise on anything. That's what he says about himself and that's what all the people closest to him always say about him. I was thinking about the Constitution Express and how like these train tracks are kind of like the spinal cord of colonization mm. that came through and then ended here in the West Coast and a couple generations and decades later your father and those delegates rode that train back. It was like kind of a returning of a wave of this energy going to say no and like I really think of what the audacity of those to just go. What was like the turning point? Like, was there a point in time when he was just mentioned, this is what we're gonna do? You mean for the Constitution Express? Yeah. Well, in our history, the government attacks us with some crazy policy they're trying to bring in, and we fight back. Mm -hmm. It was like the white paper policy. And, uh, Eventually, it was this constitution that they wanted to bring to Canada that didn't include us. And at first, they were fighting all across Canada, different bands, different um, tribal groups. You know, it wasn't all just coming from one place. It wasn't unified. And so he's in British Columbia, and he can't help thinking big. And uh, between him and his staff, they came up with this idea of, forming this huge lobby, this big united front that would go to Ottawa and lobby. It amazes me to be able to unify a country of people without the internet. Because mm. we've yeah. got the internet now, we can barely do it. I think it, even if he had the internet, he wouldn't have used it. Mm -hmm. He was a firm believer of you go knock on somebody's door. Right. You got to go look a person in the eye and you have mm -hmm. to educate them one-on-one -on -one about what the urgency is and he'd go from community to community like that.
If you really believe we have been here forever, if you really believe, if you really believe, you don't ask for it, you take it. My message to you, my message to you, you don't ask for it. You take it. This is the route you're forcing us to by not cooperating, by expropriating our rights, by taking away our rights in terms of fishing, in terms of wildlife, taking away our rights towards sovereignty. I think you are compelling our people. I remember that time in 1980 and 1981 when the Trudeau government was trying to leave out the Aboriginal rights and title in Canada. I just saw my parents just, this was the focus because we were going to be directly affected. It was very community oriented and, you know, very grassroots and making sure that everybody was involved, elders, young kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, families and the women and their babies going on the train and, and so forth. And, you know, that that was a big deal. And, and everybody was, was on board, you know, pun intended, but they were on board. This Indian government flag design was thought of, and everybody had input about what it meant. You know, the four directions and our heart, and it just took off like wildfire. Everybody wanted to wear it. And so I started whipping up these shirts really fast <laughs> and uh, selling them right away and stacking up the money for the Constitution Express. Yeah, yeah. I remember Dad wearing that too. and. Uh talking about raising money for the Constitution Express, it was um, it was so expensive to have those people from Vancouver to go to Ottawa, and, mm -hmm. and people sold their furniture, and um, they did whatever they could to, to raise money. That's what your and dad did, right? <laughs> he did, he sold his furniture. I remember thinking about his apartment and everything that was gonna go, and he, you know, he was just, I said, so you're just gonna sell your furniture and you're just gonna go? And he said, yeah. My dad, Ron George, was one of the organizers for the Constitution Express train to Ottawa and then on to Europe later. And what I remember is him saying how this movement was so spiritual and different than anything he's ever experienced. There was a code of conduct. Uh, people treated each other with respect and honor. And there was no dissension between people at all. It was just, they had a goal, they had it, they were following your father, your father's vision, George Manuel, and uh, you know, they, they were following his leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a speech of his just the other day, mm -hmm. and he's talking to a big crowd of people and he's saying, you know, um, we gotta have, have at least a thousand people going on the European Constitution Express. Can we do it? Can we do it? And you just hear this roar of people, just, yes! It just, it made me cry, mm. listening to it, listening to the power of our people. If 
you really believe our children deserve an education, if you really believe our children deserve to eat, if you really believe our children deserve to drink clean water, if you really believe our children deserve a home, if you really believe, if you really believe, you don't ask for it. You take it. My message to you, my message to you, you don't ask for it. You take it. The control of our hunting, fishing, the control of our Indian children, the control of our Indian lands, the recovery of our right to govern ourselves, the right to determine our own future. And we've been denied all those rights and all those resources. The shift at that time was to see ourselves as a larger collective, a larger group of people trying to pressure governments and the media to change the way that they treated us, to change the way that people viewed us. One of the things that Dad really talked a lot about is that there was a legal action moving forward, and there always needed to be a political action, and the Constitution Express was the political action, and they fed each other, they supported each other. And then also part of that was winning over the media, because when you won over the media, you won over the public. You know, I think that that was the beauty of what your dad did. Canadians at that time were so ignorant. They still are about our situation. You know, wherever we went, when we'd finish doing our presentations, they'd get up and they'd say, I'm Canadian. Why don't I know this? Why did I go through school and I didn't know these stories that you're telling us? And it was the voice of the people from the communities that I think really helped. If you really believe in your own voice, if you really believe in your own past, if you really believe in your own future, if you really believe if you really believe, you don't ask for it. My message to you is, you don't ask for it. My message to you is, you don't ask for it. You don't ask for it. If you really believe, if you really believe, You take it! Implementation of Indian government means taking with or without the cooperation of the provincial government or the federal government. We as Indians in British Columbia, through the World Council of Indigenous People, is going to be compelled to take our case to the United Nations. We're going to be compelled to take our case to, to the world community. We're going to be compelled to take our case to any country who has got the commitment towards the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I think about your dad and, you know, to me, I think about who our heroes are. And maybe in my uh, <laughs> borderline worship of him, I, 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 you know, he's a deity in my world. Uh, an elder states, you know, this, this archetype of the, the elder. Who were his elders? Who did he go to when he needed assistance? Who did he talk to when he was needed to get advice? He went to communities. It was important to him not to stay in fancy hotels, not to waste the people's money that way. He liked to sleep on 
people's couches. He liked to go and talk to, like if he were alive, he'd want to just sit here and talk to you and learn from you. Because mm -hmm. that's what fueled him, is looking into the eyes of young people who wanted a better life for themselves, who had dreams and ambitions and hope. What is it you want? What I'd like to see for Aboriginal people in Canada is for all Canadians to identify and see the value in Indigenous culture. I would like to see my children speaking their language, knowing who they are and where they come from, and looking anybody in the eye and saying, I am proud I am Squamish. I am proud I am Niska. I am proud I am Ojibwe. I would like for us to be seen and heard and acknowledged. This is not one thing. It's all intertwined. Um, I would like for the truth of how this country came to be to be fully understood by every single person who lives here. And I think if that happens, we have a shot of getting something right. And if it doesn't happen, then things continue the way they are. It just doesn't make sense in today's world why we still have the issues we had 50 years ago. It, it, in today's world, it shouldn't happen, and it doesn't make sense to me, and it makes me angry. I would like to see our people be given the same justice as other people in Canada, as white people in Canada. I would like to see our children become proud of their heritage again, to learn their language again, to learn from their elders again, to get their land back, to not be murdered and missing. To walk proud with your chin high and not be afraid to go out, not be afraid to be hunted like animals, as Native women are, not to be afraid of predators as Native women have become.
Oh, mm-hmm.